Good. All right, it's time for us to begin. Actually, a minute or so late. And I've got a lot of material to cover tonight. And I hope y'all will be interactive as you were on Sunday. Thank you for being out here tonight. Uh, I meant to ask Corey if he would lead us in prayer, so I hate to put him on spot, but Corey, would you mind leading us in prayer? Amen. All right, so the feedback I got after Sunday morning was excellent. I appreciate all the comments, uh, like I said, all the participation. Uh, and I ex appreciate the excitement that I actually had received from people about uh, the exercises that I put out there. People actually were excited about unplugging so I don't know if you've taken a moment this week to unplug from the world, but that was one of the weekly, that was the weekly challenge here, was to take a night to where you unplug from the world, you and your spouse, spend some quality time together, a couple hours. You could be walking in the park, playing a board game, uh, just sitting outside on the back porch, whatever it is. But uh, I was very excited to hear about that. One of the questions that came up to me, though, is I don't know who's been married 40 years or more. So I want to recognize y'all tonight. So if you are currently married and have been married longer than 40 years, or you were previously married for 40 years or more, raise your, arm, raise your hands. Y'all look around. So we've got Earl. We've got the Schultz. We've got Dick and Christy. we got... Uh, Miss Louise back there, Miss Vicki Workman that's with us tonight, Doug, and Granville. Okay, so we've got a, a nice diversity of people here that's been married for a long period of time. Longest one is Alton and Margaret, 65 years. He told me when I walked in the door that he's had two things 65 years. He's had his wife Margaret and a toaster the whole time. <laughs> I didn't ask him if he's cleaned the toaster or if it still works. But he claims he still has a toaster that's 65 years old. All right, so we looked at this verse on Sunday. Unless the Lord builds a house, they who build it labor in vain. And so we talked in our previous class, we discussed building our home and marriage with God being the chief architect. And that required work from us. We said that in order to build, we had to gain knowledge understanding, and wisdom. And that all comes from God and His Word. So we've got to work in order to do that. If not, if we're not gaining those, inf those things in our marriage, then we're doing it in vain, which means basically we're useless. So tonight we're going to continue talking about seven building blocks for successful relationships or a successful marriage. And we went over the first two on Sunday, but we're going to just briefly go back over those in just a moment. I wanted to open the class talking about a few family statistics and how this might relate to us. So 50% of all first-time marriages end in divorce. That's an alarming rate. But what's even greater than that 
is second time marriages are 70% going to um, fail as well. One million children each year have parents that are divorced. 800,000 ad adolescent pregnancies occur each year. 30% of all teenage American girls get pregnant out of wedlock, and two-thirds of those will never finish high school. 80% of the above group will go on welfare, costing taxpayers over $7 billion annually. Along with the statistics, one in three children live in a single-parent home, and this rate has tripled since 1960. In the last two decades, the arrest rate of juveniles committing murder increased 93%. And 16,000 incidents of violence occur every day in the American schools. So, no society has ever survived the long-term effects that accompany the breakdown of the family. And these statistics here are all a breakdown of the family itself. So the solution starts within our own homes and our own marriages putting the principles of Scripture in place within our marriage and within our family is where it all starts. So, the seven principles of choosing a mate. We talked about the principle of severance, and we use this passage here, Genesis 1.24, where it says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother. Does anybody recall any comments that came from severance? What does that mean? Say it again. Cutting away. Yeah, cutting away. So a man and a woman decide they want to be married. They need to cut the ties, meaning that they need to be separated from their moms and their dads on both sides. And they don't need to get married unless both of them can leave their parents and stand on their own two feet. And this means emotionally and financially. The second one was the principle of permanence. What do we mean by that? Anybody recall any comments out of that? This comes from the second part of Genesis 2.24, and it says to be joined to his wife. We talked about the bond of marriage being a permanent bond. It's something that can't be, shouldn't be severed. It should be, it was a vow that we made to one another that we made before God. And we looked at Scripture that told us that we need to keep our word. We also talked about marriage is only acceptable in three ways. That being never being married, one who has lost their spouse, or one that had to put away their wife, or their wife or husband because of adultery. So tonight we're going to go on to the rest of the principles. The third one is the principle of acceptance. That comes from, and they shall become one flesh. So what does become one flesh mean to this? What, what does that mean to you? What does it encompass? Two becoming one. What's all included in that? Okay. Need to be in agreement. You said always. Are we always going to be in agreement? Very difficult, right? But try. Okay. What other thoughts with that? come with one flesh. Putting the needs of the family ahead of the individual. Yeah. Yeah, we talked about that. A lot of people put their sales first in the marriage versus putting their wife or their spouse first in the relationship, or putting God first, I'm sorry, in their spouse and then their children, but making sure that they've got their priorities straight. Anything else that you can think of? Yeah being willing to compromise, except your faith. We have to give and take a little bit, right, in marriage. Some of us may be a little bit more than others, uh, but we all have to give and take. Any other thoughts? So, becoming one flesh really encompasses a lifetime of growing up and getting older together. I'm going to show you an image here. Train tracks. How does train tracks relate to a marriage? Think about it for a second. 
Two becoming one. Can you think of any symbolisms or anything that could relate to a marriage? Let's say the train track on the left is the husband or the man, and the one on the opposite side is the wife or the woman, and they're joining together. One has let one pass and then follow behind it. Okay. Um, but then they're on the same track. They're, they're considered one um, going down the same path. Um, that's, that, to me, that could be a marriage. Yep. Um, you know, the husband's the head, the woman follows, and they hopefully are going down the same path with compromising, agreeing, agreeing putting needs of one and the other taking turns, putting needs, and hopefully they stay on the same track. Okay. Any other thoughts? They don't stay on the same track. It's a derailed. Okay. Yeah, exactly right. So what we don't see in this picture is the left and the right track that goes for miles and miles and miles. So we take a man and a woman that decide they want to get married, which is where it connects there. Two flesh, two individuals becoming one flesh. What's those miles and miles of that husband and wife represent of track? What kind of things come along with that man and that woman? Basically every bend and turn of their life. On side. Exactly. Every bend and turn. What are some of those bends and turns that come with a husband or with a wife? Loss of job, okay. Let's talk about before they get married. A man and a woman. What are they bringing to this marriage? In-laws. In-laws, great one. Yes. I had, a, I had wonderful in-laws. Debt. Debt, yeah. What else? Some marriages bring a kid before they even get married. Yeah. So you could be bringing a child. Unique experiences from the man or from the woman as a single person. Yep. All the previous experiences that that male or female has ever had is going to come in to that relationship, Rhett. That includes different perspectives on things, different opinions, opinions that may not necessarily have to do with faith, your faith. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Differing opinions. It's good things too. It's not just good exactly. It's good things. Name me some good things that come. I mean, it's like you'd like to think that you compliment one another. Yeah. That you're good at, your spouse may not be, and vice versa. So you can compliment each other for it. Yeah. Any other thoughts? In laws. In laws. <laughs> Is your lesson about in laws tonight? No? You might want to think about that. <laughs> yeah, we bring different experiences, different backgrounds. We grew up in different homes. We have different knowledge. Okay, so take my own personal life. When I met Cynthia, I came from a religious background that uh, as a child I went to a Baptist for a little while. And then in my teenage years, uh, my parents weren't um, faithful for a while. They got into non-denominationalism. Can you believe I used to play drums in front of a congregation? That's my background. And I didn't become a Christian until I started dating my wife and started coming to the old building and then to this building and then was baptized right here in this baptistry. I had a different background than my wife who grew up in the church. I had a different knowledge of the faith. I grew up in a totally different home. So we have different experiences, knowledge, 
Our homes can be different. Our temperaments can be different. Our habits. We all come with different scars. And we have different interests. But, the two become one flesh when they grow together. And they grow together in understanding their differences, experiencing give and takes, blending their likes and dislikes, and battling through the tough stuff in life with unselfish devotion. This is becoming one flesh when we get to really know each other as a couple and we go through difficult things. As a newlywed, we look at life and think, you know, everything's going to be great. But as I said on Sunday after the wedding, the tough, it really starts getting tough because that's when you really get to know people. So, Husbands ought to love their wives, their own wives, as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. This is the principle of mutual acceptance, one flesh. It's important to marry someone who brings out the best in you, in the you and them. And as months turns to years and years to decades, then really the two become one. When we get married, we are two individuals and we become one, but it takes time, really, for us to get to know each other and become that one flesh that God really wants us to be. Any comments or questions on any of that? What about your own experiences? We've got people that's been married up to 65 years here. Would you say that you've changed over the years? Your marriage has changed? Yeah, I think, you, I think your picture kind of illustrated it, that both of those different tracks had to bend a little bit to make the, the one track. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, sometimes you could have a track that only one side bent into the other, but that's, that's probably not as strong as both of them bending a little bit. Exactly. I was looking for pictures and I found all kinds of pictures where there was one line that was straight and one bent into it. And that's, that's not what marriage is. It's two curving into one and molding to become one flesh. Good comment. All right. Fourth principle, the principle of intimacy. This comes from Genesis 2, 25. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. So let's be clear here to both husbands and wives, males and females. To gain intimacy, to really know your spouse, if you fail to understand and apply the first three principles, you're never going to find the level of intimacy that God wants you to have in your marriage. You've got to have severance, permanence, and acceptance. Would you agree with that? If you fail on acceptance, are you going to be very in it? have very much intimacy with each other. Or if your in-laws, as Hunter was talking about over there, is always in your business, or they know everything that's going on in the house, is there really going to be any intimacy, true intimacy within that, that group, that husband and wife? So we've got to follow those first three principles first. So, 1 Corinthians 7, 1 through 5. Now concerning the things which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman, nevertheless because of sexual immorality. Let each man have his own wife, and let each woman have her own husband. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due to her, 
and likewise also to the wife, or also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. God is clearly talking to us about sexual intimacy in our marriage. God has given us the approval to have sexual intimacy with our spouse and he reminds us that it's to be pure, good, and enjoyed in Hebrews 13, 4. So why do we shudder when we talk about sexual intimacy? Did y'all think I was going to talk about that tonight? Huh? Huh? Because of what? The world yeah. What happens in the world? Yeah. Everything is sexualized in our world, right? Is it wholesome? No. No, no we don't see any wholesome, really, right? It's in our TVs. It's in our music. It's in our magazines, in the newspaper. You go to certain parts of the world. It's in the streets. But God has told us that it's okay. It's a good thing, right? In marriage. In marriage. Yeah. We got to keep the right perspective. The world has made everything sexual and made it ugly and sinful. But in the right circumstances, God favors it. Husbands need to understand gentleness and how God made his wife while wives also need to understand a man's needs as well. And a woman has needs as well. But God did not intend our marriages to have sexual stands-offs that cause us trouble. So in verse 5, why did Paul list? He listed there was a reason not to have sexual intimacy. And what was it for? Fasting and prayer. Which is a good thing, right? Do we fast often? Do we pray as much as we should? I don't know. But there was two things there that Paul wrote. Sexual intimacy between a husband and wife is good, but for two causes, fasting and prayer, we should stop. Now, where does he go after that? What counsel does he get give for after prayer and fasting? Come back together. Come back together. It's a good thing again. It was agreeable on both parts. It wasn't just one guy or one woman saying, I'm doing this. Yeah, I agree. Jamie. Yep. I think it takes a while too to develop real sexual intimacy in marriage because think about kids that grow up. I know it's sexual society now, but for 18, 20, 25 years we hear sex is wrong, 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 wrong. And then in one 10 minute ceremony, everything, you know, is fine. Yeah. So it takes a while maybe to, you know, to grow in that area like you like. Yeah, I would agree with that. And then even you may, maybe there's been some abuse in the past, and that's going to be some scars that yeah. last a long time as well. Yeah, that's what I meant. You don't know. You need to know what your your partner's life has been previously, and those scars are going to impact this fourth one for sure. And as Russ said, we are told as children for so many years sex is bad, 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 bad. Stay away from it. But then, after spending $25,000 on a wedding, it's okay, right? I think that's for, for me, I was actually grateful 
that my parents didn't tell me that six was bad. They just told me why it was important and why it was good, why, what the purpose of it was, mm -hmm. what the need for it was. So for me, uh, you know, coming at it, you know, after the $25,000 wedding, I didn't, I wasn't really scared about it. I mean, I, I wasn't, um, of course I was nervous, but I wasn't scared. Yeah. And so, you know, I was actually um, excited because of the fact that my parents were just very open with telling me, doing a study with me, my brother, my mom gave me books, <laughs> you know, um, about just the beauty of it. And it's a beautiful thing. Um, but how you said how the world has made it just this corruptible, dirty kind of thing. But she tried to show me the beauty of it and yep. how it should feel, how it um, sh should go, you know, and things like that. So um, I, I was really grateful to them. They never said it was bad. Um, and I've heard other parents, you know, I've heard it. You know, my mom, my dad, no, you know, they, they just took it and showed it to me as God wanted to be seen. Yeah. So I was really grateful. I think that's great. Well, this is not a parenting class right now, but me and Cynthia have always taken the approach to be up front with our children. Once they turn 10 years old, there's things they needed to know. And you need to have those conversations. And it don't have to all be negative, as Russ said. You're teaching them why it's important under this, this particular set of reasons um, I think it's great to have those conversations Corey so I mean saying from the beginning is taking what was good and turning it into something else we see that all the way back from the garden of Eden you know he took a perfectly good fruit for the world and then it looked like how bad it be. And, and, and he's doing the same thing here I mean, uh, you know the world is, is taking something that's good and pure and twisted into something that's just disgusting. Right? Yeah. Um, but as long as we live our lives in everything the way God intended for it to be, then it's absolutely pure. It's good. It's, it's, it's what it was good for. Yep. Any other comments? All right, as far as Gunt would say, that's all I'm going to say about this topic, okay? <laughs> Unless you got something else that you want to talk about. Fifth, the principle of communication. First Peter three and seven says, Husbands likewise dwell with them or dwell with them with understanding. That's husbands dwelling with wives with understanding. What's God asking of us, husbands? A miracle. Oh, I love it. <laughs> Listen, okay. Yeah, go ahead. There is a principle coming in to this relationship that is tremendously helpful, and it's being an authentic Christian. And what goes along with that, probably central, uh, I guess, to making a successful marriage, is that concept that we see in Jesus of giving yourself to the other, being selfless. Being selfless. And boy, that, that, that covers a lot of ground right there. Yeah, it does. It does. Did you have something, Corey? Go ahead. Understand that concept and to actually communicate that 
Yeah, I'll agree with that. I was in the same boat. Any other man have a hard time communicating at first with their wives? Understanding that they really want to talk? In one of my notes here, one of the worst, one of the, one of the hardest things for a man to hear is, Honey, we need to talk. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. We're going to go into that a little bit in a minute. It can be. Yeah, it can be. I think part of it also is sharing, you know, like you said, it should not be one person talking, one person listening. The person should have time to give time to the other person to share and also talk. Yeah. And, you know, so it's like you, you got to share the time, share the communication. It can't just be one sided. So. Yeah, you need to share in those in those decisions and everybody needs to have their voice heard now it's not to say that husbands don't need to make the final decision but both parties need to be heard and be given time to be heard so can we dwell and live with someone without communicating with them well no anybody ever seen something like this yeah all the time can't tell you how many restaurants i've been to and this is what i see okay it gets worse as the newer generation comes along, does it not? We see kids 15 to 30, and I'm sorry if you're in that crowd, I see this all the time. The only communication they have is, let me send a text to my wife when she's right here in front of me, instead of actually sitting down the phones and talking. And that's really what that weekly exercise was, is sit that phone down, and have some honest communication with one another. Yeah, me and Amy made an observation when we were uh, out to dinner one night. It seemed like every older couple that we saw, they didn't have phones, but they were not talking. They were just sitting eating and not saying a word. So I, I think it can go for all ages. Yeah, so oh, it can. And I, I'm going to give you a stat here in a minute that's kind of mind-blowing to me. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. We've got the power of the world right here. You know, it's a great thing. It's a great tool. Do husbands and wives have problems communicating with each other? We can. Um, some of the statistics that I saw, or let's go back to earlier, wives. Communicating to husbands, sometimes it's difficult. My wife will tell me conversations the next day and I'll be like, this is the first time I've heard it. And she's like, we talked about this yesterday. I don't know if any other man's guilty of that, but it happens all the time. What's that? Didn't I didn't listen. And husbands, we need to listen, right? We need to be more in tune with what our wives are trying to tell us. And the other things that husbands don't need to do is while they're talking, trying to fix the problem already. Because a lot of times they're not looking for a fix. They're just looking for an ear to talk to. Somebody to understand. So some of the statistics I saw today said that the average husband and wife talk 12 minutes a week. That's unviolated, nothing in there uh, distracting. No TV, no phone, 12 minutes a week. That's eyeballing. Yeah. One survey said that husbands and wives only talk face to face, or I'm sorry, couples when they date, when they're together, communicate 50 minutes out of an hour when you're dating. As soon as you get married, it goes to 40 minutes an hour. At 20 years of marriage, it's 21 minutes an hour. At 30 years, it's 16 minutes an hour. And at 50 years, it's only three minutes an hour. 
So going back to your, your, your observation there, as people get older, it tends to be that they're communicating less. Now maybe they've talked about everything they can talk about. <laughs> I don't know. But we still need to have some communication. There's no way I'm going to get through these last two. Honor. Giving honor to the wife as the weaker vessel and being heirs together of the grace of life. 1 Peter 3, 7. What's honor entail? Respect. Respect. Special. special. How can we show our wives that they're special and be respected? What can we do, men? It's the, little things. the little things. Name some, right quick. Um, just what? Communicating. communicating is one. Yep. Yep. Fold the clothes and they need to be folded. Washing dishes every once in a while. Brian? Uh, not making them the butt of the joke and being careful on them, especially in how you talk to them, uh, to them in front of other people. Yep. Or, especially their family. Or even about them. Or about them. Never call your wife an old lady. Yeah. You'll get me in your face. Yeah. <laughs> Never say anything around the job site that you wouldn't say in front of your wife. Um. It's a deep admir admi admiration for one, and it can be seen by giving compliments, writing a card to her, sending flowers or candy, giving of your undivided time. And that's what women really want, is your time. Men, a lot of us are out busy, we're trying to make ends meet, we get home, we're tired, but our wives really want us. They want our time. So if your daughter was dating someone, would you not be looking for her? What would you be looking for in that date? I put down here, boyfriend being on time, being friendly and respectful, watching to see if he opens the door for her. Those are things that's important. Sometimes we, as when we get married, we toss all that honor out the door, don't we? We forget about it. We're hooked. I've got a ring. It shouldn't be that way. We need to honor and respect our wives more. Cherishes in there too. Cherishes in there, yeah. Yeah. All right, the last one, um, maybe I'll get through this, is response. In this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. The world obviously looks at submission in a negative way, does it not? It, doesn't, uh, it does not show weakness on one's part to be submissive. It is God's plan for the leadership in our homes and in our marriage. Again, taking something that's holy and acceptable for God and making it negative. And we see that in this world. If a man leads as God wants him to lead, if a man loves his wife as Christ loves his church, if a man practices genuine communication and honors his wife, then the response from his wife is generally going to be one of loving selflessness to his headship in their marriage. So closing out the class, because it's about to close, our highest priority should be marrying someone that has the same common spiritual goal as we do, and that's heaven. Marry someone that loves the Lord Jesus Christ, has a teachable heart, and wants to go to heaven more than anything else. That's what we need to be looking for. Any comments or questions? I hate that we breeze through this real quickly. If you've got any questions or any thoughts, bring it up in the next class. Barry will be teaching on Sunday. I look forward to it. And I know y'all will too. And he's going to have a challenge for y'all next week as well. So don't forget your challenge this week. Thank you for your time.
Good evening. Very noisy crowd tonight. That's good to hear. In order to start off our evening worship service, we're going to sing number 224. There's a rainbow in the cloud. The invitation for tonight, if you want to go ahead and mark it in your psalm books, is going to be number 270, Give Me Thy Heart. <clears throat> number 224. get something off my chest before I start tonight, and that is that I love my in-laws. <laughs> I didn't mean for that to sound like it was a negative thing, but it kind of sounded that, sounded that way, so I'm thankful that Mary Ellen stated that there's some positive things that come into a marriage, and my in-laws are definitely one of them. I wanted to start tonight with a question, and it's a question for each and every one of you to just ask yourselves. and. That is, how many times in your life do you think you have heard or said the Lord's Prayer? Um, that's the Lord's Prayer that's in Matthew chapter 6 that starts off with uh, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Um, it's said a lot of times when um, groups get together and pray, it's very prevalent in sporting events, before and after practices, that type of thing. Um, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with saying this prayer often and repeatedly. Um, sometimes I think it's good to say this prayer if we may be trying to overcomplicate prayer and not to simplify prayer but to get back to the basics. But specifically what I wanted to ask about is that phrase that says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Are we truly praying for the Lord's will to be done? Sometimes in life, things may come up and we try so hard to control that event or that circumstance, whether it be at work or at school or in the home. Things come up from our past and we just squeeze so tight. I know I do personally, trying to control that outcome. And sometimes it's so difficult to just let go and let God be in control. We must learn to be able to do this. I do believe that this still requires action on our end. 
I don't think there is, there's very few things in our life where we can say that, well, I've asked God to take care of it. I can sit on my hands and do nothing. Um, more so, I think it's a, it should be a, a, a statement of, I've asked God to take care of it, and now I can rest easy, knowing that he is in control. It's turning our minds and our thoughts over to the will of the Lord and letting him control our actions. Prayer should not be thought of as a list of demands or requests from the Lord. And it shouldn't be a request for the Lord to change his will, but rather for us to bring our will into harmony with the Lord's. I want to look at one example of praying for the Lord's will, and not as a put-off, and not as something negative, but as the most ultimate and the most perfect example of praying for the Lord's will. And it was a prayer that was done with great agony. And that's in the book of Matthew, chapter 26. And it's the prayer of Jesus in Gethsemane. In Matthew, chapter 26, verse 37, it says, And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. We know that Jesus was hurting. And we also know that Jesus probably knew the Lord's will. Continuing in verse 39, it says, He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. That last statement is so perfect and so pure. Not as I will, but as you will. We need to strive each and every day to pray for the Lord's will to be done in our lives and in those around us. And the invitation is available tonight for anybody who may need it. If you haven't turned the most important aspect of your life, the most important aspect of your soul, and that is your salvation, over to the will of the Lord, please do so. And I urge you not to wait another night. Last, last week we had a baptism and we can have another one tonight. We can have multiple tonight. Or if there's anybody who just doesn't know what the Lord's will for them is. Maybe you need help. Maybe you need prayers for the congregation. If you need any type of help tonight turning your will over to the Lord, please come forward as we stand and sing. Give me thy love.